unsolved, very strange. He deserved, for all his faults, he deserved better than that. Mm -hmm. He did deserve somebody to mourn for him. My name's Sheila Boyle, and this is my sister Kate. Hello. And we're here to tell the story about our dad, Charlie Boyle, who disappeared in 1966 and has never been seen or heard of since. He was born in Tome, County Donegal, Ireland, on the 30th of November, 1915. He was one of 12 children, we think. They didn't have records in them days. He lived in a tiny little thatched farmhouse, no water, no toilet, no electricity nothing and a lot of his siblings brothers and sisters died in childhood from tb starvation poor sanitation only four or five of them actually survived two of them never left the farm my dad and three of his brothers came over to england one to scotland to find work and then in 1939 when war broke out he was enlisted in the British Army. And during his time in the British Army, they were sent to Singapore to help out. He was on the SS Asia, which was torpedoed. And he was in the water for 17 hours. And then three days after that, Singapore surrendered. And then he became a prisoner of war. So he would have been how old? 25, 26? Yeah, mid-age. 20-ish. And the three and a half years that they were in the prisoner of war camp were absolutely horrendous. We can't envisage the cruelty and the barbaric treatment those men suffered. And thousands died. My dad was covered up for dead three times and revived by medics. They had horrendous treatment and they, he was scarred physically, but he was scarred mentally. Mm. Apparently, every day, one poor soul was picked for no reason, strung up with their arms up and their feet just that much off the ground in the fierce, fierce heat and slit with a bayonet. And within minutes, every mosquito and fly in the world was on them. Mm. And they said the screams of their men. Well, my dad was strung up twice. And then at the last minute, he was cut down and somebody else was grabbed. A lot of men could cope in the day but they were haunted at night. They couldn't sleep. There were terrible things came back to them at night. And a lot of them, when they were older, committed suicide. Mm. It totally overwhelmed them. Mm. They just couldn't keep the memories anymore. Finally, they were liberated in August 1945, and he came went back to St Albans. And they were told then, the men, just get on with it. No counselling, no help. Deal with it, get on with it, forget about it. And he went home to Ireland and recuperated. And then within six months, he was back in St Albans working, where he met our mum, Eileen. She was a nurse at St Albans Hospital. And although he had problems, my mum used to call them silences. He would go for days and not speak. But they were told, don't talk about it. Anyway, they were married in December 1948 and then eventually came to Corby where he got a job with the steelworks and a council house. And then he, they proceeded to have five children. First one only lived a week and then my brother Tom was born. Then I was born and Sheila and my brother Charlie. And by all accounts, my mum said he was a very organised, good dad. Um... Worked on steel works. Yeah. He was very responsible in that he always supported his family. Mm -hmm. he, the thought of not working would have been alien. He worked hard. He was a provider. He, he was of the generation where the men went out to work and the women looked after the house and the children. Um, and he was just an ordinary man. Worked hard. Wasn't a drinker. He would go to the pub and play dominoes and darts, but he certainly wasn't a heavy drinker. And then, like a lot of people at that time, he got a job working away in Luton, 
and he was there from Monday to Friday and came home at weekends, went to the domino, the kingfisher, game of darts, um, game of dominoes. And then he came home this one weekend in October 1966. Everything was normal. He went back to Luton, said, see you all on Friday, and was never, ever seen again. Never got to Luton. People didn't have phones in them days, so nobody could phone. And it wasn't until he didn't come home the following weekend, my mum thought, well, that's strange. If the weather had been bad and they were behind and he didn't come home, he always sent money, sent postal orders. He didn't come home, no money came. And then the following weekend, he didn't come home. We knew something was wrong. So my mum sent a telegram to his digs and got a telegram reply back saying he'd never come back since the last time he was in Colby. So he'd be actually been missing a fortnight before anybody realised that he, he was actually missing. Because the police weren't really interested, not because they didn't want to be, but because that was the law then. And they did say to my mum, if we did find him, and he said, don't tell my wife where I am, legally, they had to respect that. And where my mum worked at the time, they paid for a private investigator. And he went to Luton and asked. And after a couple months. of weeks, he oh. came to my mum and he said, the whole thing stinks, I don't want involved. The whole case stinks. Now, would Hercule Poirot have given up that easy? <laughs> But he said that the landlord of the digs where my dad was staying told him that when my dad left Luton to come back to Corby, he told them he wasn't coming back. Now, whether that's true, we don't know. Maybe the landlord was involved in mm. his disappearance. We've only got his word that my dad never got back to Luton and they wasn't expected back. He said he was going off, he was never, he'd lock, left his job, left his digs and cheerio. But the people in the darts team in Luton said no. He hadn't told them he wasn't coming back and he was down to play in a darts tournament. He'd been gone, like I say, a couple of weeks before we realised. My mum was worried sick. Oh my God, what's happened to Charlie? Money as much as anything. We were quite... Relieved because he was so strict. And my mum said, I'll have to tell the police. And Kate said, oh, mum, don't. Wait till next week and I can go to the school disco. Yeah. Oh, mum, don't. Don't we were, Give him a head start. We were oblivious <laughs> of the severity yeah. of it, to be honest, because in them days... We enjoyed freedom. Growing up, we weren't as savvy as what children are now, our age. We were quite innocent and green and like you've just said I just watched to, to the school dance whereas he probably wouldn't have let me because he was really strict he was very strict so we were quite relieved of the freedom yeah but it, as, it was only as we got older we never we thought realized. about oh my god what's happened to him mm. we never thought my mum not having any money and four children we never thought about that it was just yes although we did hear us we used to hear her crying in, in her bed you know. it was the not knowing mm. And I feel for people now when somebody's gone missing, if you know somebody's dead, you can deal with, you deal with it. It's the not like, knowing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one time, my dad had been gone <clears throat> about six months or something, and the police come to the door. And he said to my mum, did you ever hear anything mm -hmm. from your husband? And she said no. And he read out this description of this person, five foot odd tall, everything he was wearing down to his wife fronts, a chip in his tooth. Inverted V. And it sounded, my mum said, that sounds very like him. And they said, we'd like you to come to Wales tomorrow and view a body in the mortuary. And my poor mum, I remember when the policeman had gone, they were coming to pick her up. She was all in a state and she said, is that what my life's come to? Going round mortuaries, looking at bodies. But then as it turned out, that man was identified. Mm. So she didn't have to go. Mm. And that's been it, basically. I just remember her then, the shock of, oh, my God. And we were quite horrified, weren't we? A lot of people assumed he'd gone off with another woman. Mm. My mum always didn't think that. She always thought something's happened to him because if he'd gone off with another woman, he would have supported his children. My dad was very honest and he was the type that worried about what other people mm. thought of him. Because he come from such dire poverty as a child, he never felt 
good enough. He always felt inferior and he want, didn't want, he wanted to be, you know, he never ever would, he wouldn't let my mum get anything on HP credit. If you couldn't afford cash, she didn't mm. buy it. That his, his reputation and his name was everything to him. So he would not have gone off and left his children. No, and Mum also said he was so honest that if things weren't right between them, he would have sat and spoke about it. He wasn't a man to keep things like that and, you know. There was never any evidence of him drawing a pension, visiting a doctor, paying national insurance. Um, nothing ceases to exist. And we've been very unsuccessful in trying to trace him, haven't we? Which has been a shame for our family and more so our mum. And it, it, his you two know. brothers in Ireland never heard from him oh, either, no. which was very strange. He, that was his world. He was Irish through and through. Never heard a thing from him since. And we didn't hear anything at all until well, maybe 10 years ago. Oh, Mr. Burns. Yeah, when I was talking to this Irishman and another man came over and spoke and then when we'd gone, this man said to the man I was talking to, was that Charlie Boyle's wife? I thought I recognised her, he said. <clears throat> Do you know, he said, I'm looking for that woman for years. I know something about her husband and it's haunted me that I've never told her. So... This man phoned me and asked me, so told me where this man lived. So we went up to see him and he told me that my dad had been missing about five years and he was talking to Father Cronin, who was the local parish priest, fire and brimstone type of a priest. And he said to him, do you know, Father, it shocks me to my bones that Charlie Boyle went off and left his family. And Father Cronin said to him, Charlie Boyle did not leave his wife and family. Charlie Boyle never left Corby. So Mr Baird said, never left Corby, father? What do you mean? And he said, Charlie Boyle, God rest his soul, is down the clay hole. And Mr Baird said, what? And he said, father said, that's it. I've said enough. In fact, I've said too much. And he walked off. So we asked the police and they said, there is a possibility as his body's never turned up, he's never paid tax insurance. With computers nowadays, they could do a lot more checking. There was no sign, trace of him whatsoever. So it was a possibility, but there's no way of ever knowing. But Father Cronin by then had retired and was living in Kerry in Ireland. So they sent the local Garda to go and visit him, but he had dementia. He had no idea that he was even a priest. And then he had a brother, John Joe, oh, yeah. the youngest in the family, who, when he was of an age, went to Scotland 16. to find work. He was never seen again. But rumour had it from people that knew him, and word got back to his family, that he discovered women in pubs, and, and he felt guilty because he wasn't sending money home. And then the, the longer you leave it, the harder it is. But when the mother died, when my granny died, she was asking for John Joe. Mm. and they said my dad vowed he would find John Joe mm. if it's the last thing he'd done on this earth. So maybe he went looking for John Joe. You know, you, maybe he uncovered something that he shouldn't have done in trying to find out what happened to John Joe. We just don't know. John Joe never turned up either. <laughs> There's two missing Boyle men out there somewhere. <laughs> and that's basically all we know. If he was alive now, he would be 103 years old. So chances are he is dead. But where? Mm. Did he die of natural causes? If so, why was his body never found? Mm. The police think that your body's never found if it's been put somewhere, which suggests murder, which brings us back to the clay holes. But why? Mm. He wasn't political, he wasn't religious. So when the police were looking into that, they also got the special branch to investigate, being an Irish Catholic, in case there was IRA connections. And they said, no, nothing. Wasn't known to anybody. 
they were all shocked, everybody that knew him, because of his honesty and that he just wasn't a man that would do that, weren't they? The Irish community in Corby, Luton, the people he got to know in Luton, they were all quite shocked that it that wasn't the character of the man. There wasn't. Before my mum died, I would like to have, her to have known because mm -hmm. she didn't know how to feel about him. Mm -hmm. You know, when we were young, if she didn't have any money or any coal or... One time, one of us couldn't go to school so she'd finished paying for a coat and got the other one the coat off Blundell's, remember? Mm -hmm. And she'd get and she'd say, oh, bloody man. And then she'd say, oh, God, forgive me. Something yeah. might have happened to him. She just didn't know how to feel about him, which was sad. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think we'll ever know because his friends of that time are all dead and buried now. <laughs> I suppose they've got dementia, the ones that are still alive and... There's no, he's, he's, he's gone into the mists of time. Is physically everything. It, there's no trace of him whatsoever. Nothing. We even tried to find out if he'd take money out of the bank, but that was private and confidential. We weren't allowed to be told. Everything was private and confidential. My mum was allowed to know nothing. Those avenues, yeah, that, that in them days, a lot of avenues were closed to her. She just couldn't. She tried her best. So whether we'll ever find out... I remember taking some flowers up to my mum, up to the cemetery, on her anniversary, 25th of November, and it being winter, they don't last long, and I hate to see dead flowers at the cemetery. So after four or five days, I thought, oh, I'll go and get them flowers and throw them away. And I went up, and it dawned on me it was the 30th of November, my dad's birthday. Mm. And it really made me sad. I thought, where's his bones? I'm standing here at my mum's headstone mm. with her name on it. Where's my dad's bones? Mm. Mm. And that's what bothers me now. Whatever happened to him, happened to him. You know, but where's his bones? Somewhere there's a body. Is he yeah. in a shallow grave? Is he at the bottom of the clay hole? Has he got a headstone with his name on? What name, if it was a false name? If it was true and his bones were at the bottom of the clay hole and they went down and they got the bones up and they able to DNA, you know, identify him, still it would raise more questions. Hmm. Who done it? Why? Even if he had a big knife, carving knife sticking out his bones, you're still not going to know why or who. So we're never, ever going to know the entire story, ever. Hmm. And we've just been left wondering all our life, haven't we? And it does have an effect on your life as you, you grow up from being a young child. You don't realise it, but when you look back at your insecurities, it all goes back to being abandoned, really. I mean, thank God we had our mum for many, many years, but in hindsight, if something happened to poor mum, we would have been orphans. We were scarred with his actions, although he may not have been responsible for his actions. And the more you think about it, it seems you no, know, there was a lot of contributing factors to probably how he turned out as a, you know, a father and a husband. But it does impact everybody and we have never been able to solve it. So we just hit brick roads the whole time, really. Brick walls, sorry. And then you get exhausted and just carry on living your life. And then every now and again, something pops up, which makes you think, oh, well, what happened? Where is he? It's very hard. But you learn to live with it. It doesn't mean it hasn't scarred you or made you insecure in different ways through your life. But you do learn to live with that loss and that mystery. You put it on the back burner, but every now and again, you have a chat about it and Sheila has her theories and I'll have my theories and we we talk about it but it's not knowing was the hardest thing because thousands of people go missing don't they but you normally get some thread of something you know but perhaps you have nothing at all I can remember I mean I was widowed when I was 28 my daughter was only a year old and I can remember going to the hospital, expecting my husband to be 
you know, poorly broken leg or something, but he, he died. And I remember coming out of there, and my first thought was my mum. That um, feeling of somebody was there and they're not. And I can honestly say I think that was the first time I could relate to how my mum must have felt that somebody was there and then they weren't. But it was worse for her because I had a reason for it and I was able to grieve. She never did. So technically, I think it was worse for her. But that initial loss, I thought of my mum. Strange, isn't it?